I'm Renee Mills, daughter of Mary Ann Carroll, the highwayman. Wow. When you talk about the highwaymen, it's never a little bit, but um, they're a group of artists that taught themselves, self-taught artists, um, that came together in South Florida, mostly Fort Pierce, but a couple of the other cities surrounding the area. And they started painting out of a small group that grew to 26, and they taught themselves to paint the landscape, the scenery. These um, paintings that you see was actually what the area used to look like before commercialization. And the, they made a living selling them, and they had uh, two booms, the 60s and later in the uh, 70s, and no, the resurrection in the 90s. And during those periods, they made a lot of money. Uh, there appeared times when art wasn't selling and they made no money, so it was a tough business. They got the name from a gentleman named Jim Finch. He, uh, he was a businessman in the area, and paintings came across his, um, his I'd like to say desk, um, but across him a few times. And of course, he saw the trend, the pattern, and that led to a person who was loosely, um, who was, I won't say loosely, uh, he was an educator, and everything you do in education, usually you try to plan. That gentleman it was Gary Moreau. Gary Moreau took it upon himself to explore that, and he created the book. And then Jim Finch was his um, point man for, maybe there's something here with the story. And then he found my mom and Hezekiah, and I can't remember who else. And they told the story. In the 60s, wow, that was a matter of sheer resilience and uh, their, their will to succeed. Um, when, you know, when you're making 20 bucks off of a sale, you know, that was money back in those days. So what do you do? You go home, repeat, and repeat again. So then that, that's what drew the others to create the 26. And with the 26, they don't sometimes share cars. They had a planned agenda. Sometimes they had no agendas. They blindly go out and sell. I think these days now we call them blitz, blitzes. You go out and sell your paintings and you come back home, regroup. And then of course it branched off into many different things for each different artist. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I'm not going to emphasize on my mother only. I'm going to tell as much as about the artist in general. But mother, for instance, had a, a Lincoln with suicide doors. So that was pretty cool, unloading and loading paintings. And of course, you have to have deep trunks. So many of the artists had the deep trunks. So that was great for their business of selling the paintings. But um, they'd load them up. And of course, just, you know, they had their purpose of either going south, going west, east, or whatever their direction was that led them to sell. I know as far as like the uh, Brevard County, which I know most people don't know where that is, but like uh, the space shuttle, as far as that area. And that was a very nice area to sell in. Then again, as far as Fort Lauderdale and those areas, some of Miami. And um, some of them, a couple of the artists did not have cars, so they shared uh, rides with the other artists. So, Fort Pierce in Florida is kind of weird. <laughs> it's very loose, casual. Uh, you know, we're the transient state. Um, people did not often openly talk about these things. People kind of stayed in their lane, if you will. That's the new verbiage. Um, but you all, you simply go to a business, you go to um, a residence, you knock on the door, and people simply either would tell you, no thank you, goodbye, and you respectfully went your own way. Um, I don't recall any, any violence, anything absurd or outlandish like that, but there are a few funny stories. Uh, Mr. Al Blood Black, um, he was the card, he is the card. Uh, he's one of the few living artists today. I think we have about four left now. And uh, he was, amazing to be around because he told the craziest stories but there are times when he would get out of the car and I guess all the dogs loved uh, Mr. Blood because I remember being on one of the selling expeditions where my sister was driving this time my mom asked him to take some paintings and he went to go to a car go to the door and the people sick their dog on him so <laughs> he'd take off 
And he jumped on the car like the Dukes of Hazzard, got in the car, rolled off. So then, you know, clearly we were never coming to that residence again. But the businesses were just pretty much like um, no soliciting. Uh, but as far as the racial tensions were, that pretty much limited itself to the fact that, you know, they're not hiring blacks. So I guess if you see that sign, you pretty much knew not to go in there. Alfred Hare, who we consider like the the figure of the artist, Alfred um, Hare passed away. Um, that's a separate story. Uh, a movie's going to be released about him shortly. Um, Alfred Hare was taught he had the pleasure of being taught by Mr. Beanie Backus. Uh, Beanie Backus was known as a wealthy white man that lived like right just where you could see the St. Lucie River. And he had this nice, that was one of his many homes and it was very airy, no air conditioning. You could see the, the, the curtains blow through this house. And um, he taught him, was giving him lessons. And the lessons therefore uh, catapulted him into being a very independent, sharp taught artist. So at whatever declaration people chose to consider him still self-taught, but he was taught, that's for each person to decide. Um, but Mr. Backus is, is given a lot of credit, but um, my mother, her credit went to Harold Newton. Harold was probably about the third or the fourth artist to start painting in pattern. And he taught my mother to mix her colors. Then she jumped on the bandwagon, but they were considered self-taught. My heart is full. Um, I was born in 69, so I grew up around these paintings my whole life. And uh, I remember like some of the darker ones. Mr. Hare had, he, I don't remember if I ever got to meet him or not, I never thought about trying to dig that far, but he had bought a house on our street and that whole room was full of dark paintings, the black, and a lot of base line paintings were black and had a lot of dark influential, dark influence. And some of the other artists who he mentored in that group followed suit. Um, mother, Jim Finch had coined her as the one with the light pastels and he said, I don't want to quote, but I swore I heard girly colors because I took offense to it because I was in corporate trying to kick down doors. And uh, mother has always been a trailblazer. Where she was trailblazing to, only she and God knew, but she was a trailblazer and she did the pastel, the pretty colors, the soft colors. And a lot of the other artists you can see throughout time where they've had their, their stint with the soft colors. But I think for the vast majority, I want to say uh, probably all 26 have tried the lighter colors. Uh, Mr. Butler, he was a very debonair man. He died way too early. He had more of the Western light pictures and maybe that was his influence from being from Okeechobee. But um, the paintings like some of, like Mr. McClendon, um, Mr. Knight, they all had a lot of crisp paintings. I cannot uh, deny Mr. Gibson. Um, he was a very, he was a very debonair guy, and he wrote. He had some paintings that just really spoke out to you. We called him the three D painter by the millennia because his paintings. He started layering on the paint, and it looked like they like it came off the canvas. Because by this time, all the artists are doing canvas because the Upson board no longer existed. So um, the colors. You can tell by their hues. Some of the artists had different hues. Uh, some of them were very crisp in their technique, and others went a little bit more, I don't want to say soft, but it kind of blew, um, what do you call it? <laughs> Old age. They, uh, they rolled the colors in together and they blended them more softly. So there was more softer contours and more crisp contours with uh, some of the artists. And you can tell their style by the techniques, what they painted as well. Alfred Hare, uh, when they started seeing the money coming in, and this is retold to me. Um, um, I, I know what mother told me, what I heard, and what I've been retold. Uh, but he is known for the assembly line painting, where they tapped up the boards, a one by four, basically. Tapped them up on the trees or on the houses. And... Um, 
and I remember the house he bought down the street from us that had the, the, the boards tapped in there. And this is where they did the assembly line painting. So he, Mr. Alfred Hare and a few others who, when they started doing this, got their uh, up some boards on there. And one guy would go through, do all the base. The other guys do the layers. And it was very clever for them, you know, being, you know, insightful and, and smart and, and intuitive engineering <laughs> to uh, using these processes to spit out more paintings. I hate to spit out because it's such, this is such beautiful work, such treasure work, such priceless work. And they did this to get these out, these paintings out faster when they had an audience. Uh, as far as mother, mother uh, did do the tapping onto the home house. For a few years, she had a gallery. And then of course, when weather was not so kind in Florida, she moved it inside the house and Sometimes that meant we all had to sleep in one room. She put the paintings wherever she had to move them. And so the other technique was this type of paint. Um, some people looked at, they looked down on the fact that they thought like he would, that it was known that he used house paint to get that base. Mother, um, she swore by it and she took offense to people saying she ever used house paint. So in the book, it clearly says she never used anything but oils. So the different types of oils, um, Mr. Lewis and a couple others, they dabbled with some acrylics. So some of the artists chose to go a different path. Maybe it was cost of product, different things like that. Mother had a car since she was 15. So of course she was driving around. And um, what no one knew is that she had several jobs and paid for car cash. So she was driving around the corner and found um, Harold Newton painting. This was a cool cat. He wore his cowboy hat. He had the chops and uh, he was tough. Uh, he was painting outside under the tree and she wheeled that big Lincoln around. I was like, you know, uh, hey, no, she didn't have the Lincoln yet. Uh, she was driving her first car and she said, um, hey, can you teach me, you know, how to do the painting? So he showed her how to mix that that red. We call it the poinciana red. And um, that's, she was sucked in. She was like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Now, mindful, she was already an artist. She had many trades from being a young girl. And she was already drawing things and had this crazy imagination. So when she met Harold, she formally became the highwayman. Well, one of the guys, they were formally named the highwaymen in 1994. Well, mother often say these turkeys, uh, they trying to get by on me, you know, she would see stuff like that. But they, the one thing about them, they were competitive with one another, you know, it's how to make money, it sells. Uh, and like anything, there's a competitiveness that fuels us to be our best in our work, what we produce. Uh, making money, but they all definitely looked after each other. Uh, they, they, you know, they loved each other. They were all, you know, Christians, and yeah, they looked after each other. But at the same time, oh, let it let's let's get down to it. It's on. So absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I'm not easily impressed. I'm in awe of this place. I've had nothing but peace. I have lost track of time, space, uh, you name it. The, all the things that's going on in this place, I've never seen it before, happen before in one place. So congratulations, I'm coming again. And it's places like this where art needs to be so that it can continue to spread the word. So in order to do that, one, we have to take this Florida news because it seems like all we ever do is produce bad stories. Uh, get this story out of Florida, get it into the schools, get it across the U.S. Because sadly, uh, it's been out into other countries <laughs> and it hasn't even made it to other states. Uh, mother had a picture in four countries when I was in high school. So here it is. Um, I think Tony said, I'll let him tell that story about 109 places now. But we got to tell the story. And now that we're global, we're global lives. We're, we're in a global, a world of globalization. We definitely got to get it past the U.S. and definitely global. But more importantly, in the books, all history starts in the books, and it definitely has to start with this digital world we live in, and keep telling the story and keep showing the kids what paradise I grew up with.
Gary Moreau did a couple of them, and they're great because um, it, it stretched people to understand the topography, um, the horticulture of it all. More important, importantly, that these people were humble people. They never treated themselves like celebrities. Um, Onyx Magazine in Orlando, um, Rich really does a good, great job about trying to get things out in Central Florida about um, black history. Um, and then I'm doing Mother's Book. Mr. Lewis has a few books out. I'm telling Mother's Biography because she and I started writing it together. And um, when she kind of got distracted, I kept writing. And now that she's gone, there's, I feel like there's a, a third piece that has to be told. So um, it's my goal, my desire, my ambition, and my mission that I put it in the history books, even though our history books are being modified. It's imperative that I get it out in the history books across the U.S. Uh, it would be robbery, and those are my mother's words. It would be robbery if uh, people didn't come out and see this because each painting has a story and while some of them overlap, like two of the paintings back there were done at the same time, and now it's taken almost probably 50 years that they've come back together, the, the paintings don't overlap themselves. So it's definitely a must see. You can see 26 different artists and their amazing stories in these pictures. And the crazy part is you won't get this opportunity again, except you come here to, till December 1st. So I'm Dr. Wanda Renee Mills. Everyone calls me Renee, and uh, my social page is Renee DeVagno.